good morning to all we are about to start the national webinar on marine biodiversity and conservation organized by internal quality assurance cell of snm training college muttagunam we shall begin today's session by invoking the grace of almighty i invite ms lakshmi priya bhd student of our uh, college for the prayer ചിത്തൂരി ശനി വാഴ്ത്തുവിൻ ചിന്തയ Thank you, Lakshmi Priya. Respected management, beloved principal, respected resource person, esteemed part participants, dear colleagues, beloved students, a very good morning to you all. On behalf of SNM family, I have great pleasure to welcome you all to the national webinar on marine biodiversity and conservation organized by IQAC of SNM Training College. This is the ninth webinar of our teacher empowerment webinar series which discuss about various topics that are relevant in present day. In today's webinar, the topic of discussion is marine biodiversity. The theme of environment day of the year 2020 was celebrate biodiversity. While talking about biodiversity, we often think about land ecosystem like forest and marine biodiversity is not much discussed. The marine biodiversity is also very important. For example, about 70% of oxygen that we breathe is produced by marine plants. It is estimated that by the year 2100 more than half of the world's marine species may stand on the brink of extinction if proper conservation strategies are not adopted i hope today's deliberation will help us to know more about the importance of marine biodiversity and its conservation in this esteemed occasion it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar firstly i would like to extend a warm welcome for HMTP Prabha, the management of our institution. Dr. Asha Oyas, principal of SNM Training College, who extends wholehearted support and guidance for us to organize this webinar, is here to deliver the inaugural address. I welcome our dear principal to this webinar. The resource person for today's webinar is Dr. P. Lakshmi Lata, principal scientist and head of Molluscan Fish Fisheries Division, at Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute Kochi she has a long experience in the field of molluscan research she wholeheartedly accepted our invitation to present the theme of this webinar on behalf of SNM training college i offer a warm welcome to her the strength of any program is its participant i am delighted to extend a hearty welcome to you all i also welcome all my dear colleagues and students who are always there to extend their timely help once again i welcome each one of you to this webinar and wish you all successful deliberations thank you now i welcome our beloved principal dr asha oyes to deliver the inaugural address respected management officials respected resource person dr lishmi leda principal scientist and head cmfr i kochi respected participants my dear colleagues and friends a very good morning to one and all at the outset 
with immense pleasure i may convey our deepest gratitude to cmfri for collaborating with us in organizing our 10th event of teacher empowerment webinar series also for providing a very resourceful person in this regard i am delighted to share with you that snm training college fraternity could celebrate nine webinars on versatile and socially relevant themes during this covid pandemic period no doubt today's webinar theme marine biodiversity and conservation is a very relevant theme in a global perspective as we all are the inhabitants of this lovely planet the climatic conditions of these days itself points towards this notion the webinar coordinator dr sunidhi is worthy of special mention in this aspect the global system that makes the earth habitable for human kind is driven by the oceans at large it provides and regulates the water resources climate food and even the oxygen in the air the careful management of this essential global resource is imperative for a sustainable future unfortunately there is a continuous deterioration of coastal waters owing to pollution and ocean ocean acidification is having an adverse effect on the functioning of ecosystems and biodiversity the un sustainable development goals aim to achieve a better and more sustainable future for the inhabitants the 14th index of sustainable development goals envisions as life below water and its ambit covers to conserve and sustainably use the oceans seas and marine resources for sustainable development the targets of this goal focus mainly on the judicious management of marine biodiversity and it reminds the commitment and responsibility of every individual in this respect according to unesco the ocean can be an ally against covid-19 it is very interesting to know that bacteria found in the depths of the ocean are used to carry out rapid testing to detect the presence of covid-19 before concluding i would say the health of the ocean intimately tied to our health the pandemic offers an opportunity to revive the ocean and start building a sustainable ocean economy with these remarks let me proudly inaugurate this webinar by quoting the famous words no water no life no blue no green wish you all the best wish you a fruitful day today thank you it's time for our theme presentation for that we have dr p lakshmi lada principal scientist and head of mft at cmfri kochi she took msc in mariculture from kochi university of science and technology she secured her phd in crustacean physiology in 1991 from kochi university of science and technology she has a long experience in cmfri from 1993 She contributed to the development of hatchery seed production of bivalves, gastropods, and the growth of commercial bivalve mariculture in the country. Her areas of research include molluscan fisheries and culture, coastal and bi marine biodiversity, ecosystem-based fisheries management, and biodiversity conservation. In recent years, she worked on coral reef ecosystem, valuation of marine ecosystem, and molecular taxonomy. she is very much concerned about the conservation of marine fisheries and ecosystem based fisheries management principles i think we got the act person to talk about the theme of this webinar marine biodiversity and conservation with great pleasure i welcome lakshmi lad for her presentation over to you ma'am thank you dr suniti so good morning a very warm 
uh, good morning and a very pleasant day to all of you. Uh, thank you for the very nice introduction by both Dr. Suniti and uh, the pre president. And uh, it's nice, very heartening to hear uh, that uh, you're uh, very much aware about the current status of uh, biodiversity and the need for conservation. So that makes my task easier. And I think I sh it will be easier for me to convey what I, would, uh, what I have prepared. And I hope uh, the target group, the teachers, will benefit to a large extent on this subject which is actually very, very wide. There is a lot that can be talked on and on and on. But I am sure I have to restrict my uh, uh, presentation for maybe about an hour. So to the extent possible, I shall share whatever possible regarding marine biodiversity and the great need for conserving this biodiversity and save our planet. So before I begin uh, the actual thing, some basic facts. Uh, the ocean, you know, as you know, covers 70% of our planet and represents over 95% of the biosphere. Marine and coastal habitats include coral reefs, mangrove forests, seagrass beds, estuaries, hydrothermal vents, sea mounds, soft sediments on the ocean floor, all below the surface. Now, apart from the source of food, the ocean is one of the largest natural reservoirs of carbon. It stores over 15 times more carbon dioxide than the terrestrial biosphere and soils and plays a very significant role in climate moderation. And the deep sea habitats, they host between 500,000 to 10 million species. Deep sea life is essential to life on Earth because of its crucial role in the global biogeochemical ge cycles, including nutrient regeneration and oxygen. Oceans are seriously underprotected, with only about 0.8% of the oceans and 6% of the territorial seas being in protected areas. We depend on the ocean for fisheries, and 80% of the world's fish stocks for which assessment information is available, they are either fully exploited or overexploited, and thus require effective and precautionary management. So what is biodiversity? Biodiversity, coming to biodiversity, it's a way, what is, how do we define it? It is the variability that is prevalent among living organisms from all sources, which means terrestrial, marine, other aquatic ecosystems, and ecological complexes of which they are their part. Now, this includes diversity within species, between species, and ecosystems. This definition is given by the Convention of Biodiversity in the year 1992. This is the very broad uh, encompassing definition, which is widely accepted. Now, what are the elements of biodiversity? They are the fundamental properties of an ecosystem. And in the marine realm, these encompass all life forms, including the environments they inhabit, and it scales from genes to species to ecosystems. Now, the conven uh, con Convention of Biological Diversity, its sustainable use and the equitable sharing of its benefits are the main benefits and objectives as decided by the Convention on Biological Di Diversity. And we know that 192 states and the European Union are party to this Convention on Biological Diversity. And this meeting, which was held in Aichi Taiko, they have five goals, strategic goals. And the last decade was totally dedicated for the biodiversity conservation. This goal A decide is the is to address the underlying causes of biodiversity loss by mainstreaming biodiversity across government and society. The goal B is to reduce the direct pressures on biodiversity and promote sustainable use. The goal C is to improve the status of biodiversity by safeguarding ecosystems, species, and genetic biodiversity. Now, goal D will enhance the benefits 
to all from biodiversity and ecosystem services. Goal E will enhance implementation through participatory planning, knowledge management, and capacity building. Now, these uh, goals I have listed, as I proceed, we will see more of these things coming up. Now, what is species diversity? It is the variety and frequency of different species. And why is it important? Is that it identifies and characterizes the biological community of a habitat and ecosystem. So what is genetic diversity? It is the variety and frequency of different genes or genomes within each species. Now the characteristics of genetic diversity in marine plants or animals that are valuable for human use, such as resistance to a pest or disease or medicinal potency may occur in only a few individuals of the species or in small subpopulations. So the basic unit of conservation of genetic diversity is therefore the plant or animal population. So now come to the larger this thing that is the ecosystem diversity. Now the variety and frequency of different habitats or ecosystems and the processes that shape them. This is ecosystem diversity. Now three things are involved in this. The biological structure is maintained by the dynamic processes that is physical, chemical, and biological. The physical includes ocean currents, winds, waves, and erosion, while chemical includes salinity, sediment geochemistry, pH, runoff, etc. And biological includes migration, predation, reproduction, and larval drift. So you can see this is the uh, exclusive economic zone of India, which encompasses the marine zone. And here we are interested in the marine biodiversity within this zone. Now, India has a coastline of over 8,000 kilometers and the exclusive economic zone of 2.02 million square kilometer, which I just showed you in the map. The continental shelf area is nearly 3,72,000 kilometers square kilometers spread across nine maritime states and seven union territories, including the islands of Andaman and Nicobar and Lakshadweep. Now, India represents 2.5% of the world's landmass and supports a population of nearly 1.3 billion people. India is also one of the 17 mega biodiverse countries in the world, with 7.8% of the recorded species, uh, including 45,000 recorded species of plants and over 91,000 recorded species of animals. The marine ecosystem is extremely diverse attributed to the geomorphological and climatic variations along the coast. Now the habitats, coastal and marine habitat includes the near shore, the gulf waters, the creeks, tidal flats, mud flats, coastal dunes, mangroves, marshes, wetlands, seaweed and seagrass beds, delta plains, estuaries, uh, lagoons and coral reefs. So coming to the, these ecosystems, the marine biodiversity as a, is again redefined as an aggregation of highly interconnected ecosystem components or features encompassing all levels of biological organization from genes, species, populations to ecosystems with the diversity of each level having structural and functional attributes. So now our interest is on the marine ecosystems. Now what are the, I already mentioned the ecosystems, but more we are going to focus on the mangroves, the seagrass breads, the estuaries, the coral reefs, the island ecosystems. And beyond this, we also have the coral reefs, the deep hydro, hydrothermal wells. I'll come one by one to each of these. Now, this is just a diagrammatic representation. You can see the mangroves and their functions. They prevent erosion, all these things. Once again, I will be talking. Then you can see, see, see grass. And then beyond that is the coral reefs and coral formations. And we have the other zones where you have the other flow, uh, pelagic forms, fish, and other things. So this is just the 
uh, what is it, just a schematic representation. Now we'll come to each ecosystem. In mangroves, I'm sure each one of you have seen a lot of mangroves. Now what are mangroves? Mangroves are salt tolerant plants of tropical and subtropical in the intertidal regions of the world. The specific regions where these plants occur are termed as mangrove ecosystem. They are highly productive, but extremely sensitive and fragile. They are extremely important to our own well-being and to the health of the planet. Now, I'm sure you're all aware that during the last tsunami, the places where a large uh, uh, occurrence of the mangroves were there, for example, the Andaman Islands, they were least affected by the impact of tsunami because of these mangroves, which served as strong protectors and prevented soil erosion. So this is a very, very significant ecosystem which needs a lot of conservation to keep us, to, which is important to our well-being and the marine diversity. Now, if you see in the glo global scenario, mangroves occupy less than 1% of the world's surface and they are found between mainly the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn in uh, all continents and covering an estimated 74% of the tropical coastline worldwide. There are more than 18 million hectares of global mangroves inhabiting, covering in uh, 112 countries and territories in the tropical and subtropical region. And about 34 and 20 minor mangrove species belonging to about 20 genera or 11 families have been recorded globally. Now, what are the services provided by mangroves? As I mentioned earlier, it's a very, very important ecosystem. Now, it forms the basic complex marine food chain. Very important. It forms the marine complex marine food chain. And they provide important permanent and temporary habitats for a large number and range of marine and terrestrial fauna. The marine fauna commonly found in the mangroves include mollusks, wide range of fish, and saltwater crocodile. And they're also used as breeding grounds for prawns, shrimp, and fish. Critical habitat for fisheries and coastal bird populations. They perform the filtering and assimilating pollutants from a plant runoff. Besides stabilizing sediments and protection of shorelines from erosion. Water and atmospheric quality improvements, that is that by retaining and recycling nutrients is also carried out in the mangroves. It also provides us with food and water, medicinal herbs, timber, fuel and materials. Now this is, uh, what is it? It's a simplified mangrove food web, but actually it has several layers of trophic levels and this is very very difficult to understand but this is a simplified version you have the primary product produce producers that is the mangroves you have the terrestrial grazers you have the uh, decomposers you have the deposit feeders you have the benthic ma megafauna you have the oysters you have the phytoplankton and zooplankton i mean this is a very very complex food web but here it just shows the simplified version. <coughs> now, this mangrove, I already mentioned, it has many associated fisheries as well. A lot of uh, clam fisheries is also occurring in the mangrove areas besides fish, fish, pin fish. And you also have sand mining being carried out. And now the new trend is that we are doing a lot of farming activities also in the mangrove areas. <coughs> Now coming to the next ecosystem, that is the estuary. You know that estuary is what is interface where the river and meets the sea. So you can see a lot of activities go on in this particular marine ecosystem. It is so complex, but it is also very vital for fisheries and many other activities. Now it's a transition zone between river environment and marine environment. But they are the most productive ecosystems in the world. There are many different habitat types found in and around estuaries, including shallow open waters, freshwater, salt marshes, swamps, 
sandy beaches, mud, sand flats, rocky shores, oyster reefs, mangrove forests, river deltas, tidal pools, and sea grasses. Many animals rely on the estuaries for food, place to breed, migration, and they are highly productive, supporting unique communities of flora and fauna. Now, what are the services of estuaries? They are exclusively important from the ecological, economic, social, and cultural point of view. They act as breeding and feeding grounds for many aquatic animals and birds. They are also they serve as a buffer for the coast from storms and floods. They filter sediments and pollutants. They record of past environments and events occur here, and it's also a place for recreation such as water sports, fishing shellfish gathering, duck shooting, bird watching, etc. and also a site for marine farms. Now what are the major threats? This again, uh, almost similar to what happens in the mangroves, there is excess silt flowing from the land clearance and pollution from sewage, industrial waste, agricultural runoff occur, oil spills and oil spillage and again, invasion by introduced species, reclamation for marinas, extraction of sand and gravel, and also a lot of construction activity for harbors, channels, embankments, roads, and also natural disasters. They affect this environment drastically. And there is also conversion of these uh, estuaries for mining aquaculture, agriculture, salt pans, urban development. So there is an overexploitation by the traditional users. So you can see all these activities are going on simultaneously in the estuaries. Now this forms, uh, what is it, it impacts the environment, the very, very sensitive environment of the estuarine ecosystem, which needs to be controlled and regulated. Now coming to caudal reefs. It's a, it is, for coral reefs are known as the rainforest of the oceans. They form only 0.2%, but they form hab habitat to one third of the fish species and habitat to tens of thousands of other species. It's so beautiful, the aesthetic value, the cultural value, the recreation value of the coral reefs are very immense. They provide protection to coastlines, they provide economic resources, the biodiversity is so unique and the natural beauty. There are estimates of the, this valuable resource. It co contributes nearly 400 billion in environmental goods and services. Now, this colony support millions of people with goods and services. That is, it provides seafood, it provides medicines, there are recreational possibilities and coastal production. You know, now there are a lot of uh, such coral reefs which are open for tourism. So now these coral reefs are the most fragile ecosystems and they are threatened by this kind of activities. The biodiversity is severely affected. Just for the aesthetic value, people come to the coral reefs and they, give, they have a high cultural value and they're generated and sustained by the biological communities. And basically, there are three types of reefs the fringing reef, the barrier reef, and the atolls. Now the threats, as I said, there are natural threats and the anthropogenic threats, that is man-made threats, human threats. Now the natural includes hurricanes, earthquakes, predators, competitors, volcanoes, bleaching, pathogens, etc. Here you can see one of the major predators in coral reefs is known as the, uh, uh, the synthon. That, uh, that's a big predator which is found usually in all the coral reefs. And human activities, they are more destructive than the other threats. The overfishing, development activities, dredging, mining, and recreation. These destroy the coral reefs a lot. And it's a very, very, very fragile ecosystem. You can see it has a lot of, uh, I mean, they exclude the diversity is unique and exclusive. It needs to be seen. Now, I, coming back to the basic point, that is all the coastal resources, they have several uses. 
you know there is the it is used for fisheries aquaculture agriculture mining then on the other side you have the de development navigation ports harbors recreation human settlement and industries besides this you also have rehabilitations users exploitation and then based on economic pressure and political pressure we need to take severe management measures to conserve these coastal resources now this is again just a schematic how you can see mangroves seagrass seaweed coral fish so these vital elements need to be conserved now coming to seagrass beds you can see this again is a very very special kind of ecosystem these are smaller ecosystems but very unique in the sense that the food web here is very very unique because it depends entirely on the seagrass the seagrass provides uh, a very significant uh, what do you say habitat for the dugongs the turtles and you can see it is uh, it comprises of true flowering plants but wholly submerged in salt or brackish water and is very critical for number of threatened species including the dugongs the manatee the sea turtles and the sea lions now what are the services provided by the seagrass ecosystem the main very important thing is the carbon sequestration and apart from that sediment stabilization they bind shallow water sediments in coastal waters with their rhizomes and baffles wave and currents with leafy canopy this traps the sediments and allows stabilization thus sustaining beaches and counteracting erosion the seagrass blades serve as habitat for microorganisms especially foraminifera that helps to reduce produce beach sediment then maintaining the water clarity it removes the land based dissolved nutrients and thereby facilitating absorption by seagrass blades and associated epiphytes it's also a primary food source for manatee and turtles these are endangered and apart from that urchins and parrot fish also feed directly on the seagrass blades it forms an important feeding and nursery ground to complete life cycle for many marine uh, animals several species depend on the seagrass that is which includes the queen conch the spiny lobster stingrays shrimps various species of urchins stony crab sea cucumber worms anemones acidians and sea horses the tropical sea grasses are important in their interactions with mangroves as well as coral reefs now what are the major threats increased suspended matter in coastal waters tourism real estate development dredging thermal discharges oil pollution effluent and gully discharge agriculture charcoal beach development all these have a very severe impact on the seagrass beds the turtles have been known to disappear when completely the seagrass beds are damaged the in indirect impacts are nutrient sediment loading from watersheds removal of coastal vegetation and hardening of the seashore so this is just one example you see the potential ecosystem response when when there is loss of turtles that is if you see uh, the loss of large snakes with turtle conservation if you move from top right to the uh, left you will see how it impacts the food cycle when turtles are removed what happens when they are, the what happens when the sharks are population is reduced and what happens ultimately so this is very very important because there is top predator loss when there is large herbivore loss also now coming to another unique ecosystem that is islands island ecosystem of course the coral reefs are also islands especially in lakshadweep you see there are small small islands but the island ecosystem per se it is again uh, despite the size category climate social conditions they they share commonality what is known as the isola effect that means isolation physical seclusion of islands as an isolated pieces of land now this is exposed to different kinds of marine and climatic disturbances and there is limited access to space products and service so 
the perceptions and attitudes of islanders are also different because of this phenomena they also are highly dependent on outside sources for food fuel and even employment which increases the economic fragility of many islands they are also otherwise they are known as biodiversity hotspots and these also need a lot of management measures now we come to the other two segment of uh, environment uh, ecosystem that is the deep sea corals now what are deep sea corals they are large accumulations of stony corals forming a complex three dimensional skeletal framework and these occur in very deep waters that is beyond 200 meters to nearly 2000 meters deep often on the continental slopes submarine plateaus ridges and sea mounds the deep sea coral reefs can be very large very beautiful spectacular and they are nearly 40 kilometers long and over 3 kilometers wide the main threat to these coral reefs is the trawling by modern fishing vessels and they are also vulnerable to fishing because they are very fragile and easily broken the deep sea corals grow very slowly and they mature deep reefs take many many years to accumulate this is a, a picture of the deep sea corals you can see how fragile they look but they are very unique in their species diversity this is again another one you have the black corals the primnoid coral the feather stars which flourish at nearly 3000 meters deep in the davidson sea mount of the coast of california you can see they are very unique you know you will not find them anywhere else and the other ecosystem also which is of very vital importance to the ocean uh, the conditions is the deep sea hydrothermal vents now what are these in 1977 when the scientists were exploring the galapagos rift along the mid ocean ridge in the eastern pacific they noticed a series of temperature spikes in their data now what is this due to this is so drastic changing that from near freezing to 400 degrees so this made the scientists a very fascinating discovery known as the deep sea hydrothermal vents this is a unique entirely unique ecosystem including hundreds of new species existing around the vents despite the extreme temperatures and pressures toxic minerals and lack of sunlight that is a characteristic of this deep sea vent ecosystem the species living here are thriving how it was later realized that bacteria were converting the toxic vent minerals to usable forms of energy through a process called chemosynthesis for providing food for other vents now you can see here we know generally what happens how is primary productivity happening it is through photosynthesis but in these vents it is through chemosynthesis they use the bacteria use the energy and convert them into uh, from the chemicals into energy for the uh, existence of the animals in the vent around the vent whereas in the Uh, uh other cases it is from the green plants the uh, uh, photosynthetic food chain happens whereas here it is the chemosynthetic food chain now finally i will come to the ecosystem services now we saw the different kinds of ecosystems we saw the different uh, ecosystems how they are and what are the major threats they are facing Now we also need to understand what are the services that we get from the ecosystem services. I already mentioned in that uh, uh, the thing biodiversity targets, and here you can see the marine coastal ecosystems. They sustain numerous flora and fauna, which provide useful services for humans. Now the quality of the ecosystem service depends on the ecosystem health and resilience. If the ecosystem is degraded, what will happen? the resilience will be lost and the services will be reduced biodiversity needs to be protected and reduce the impact of the anthropogenic activities on the ecosystem functions so conservation of biodiversity is the starting point in ecosystem approach to management
Now, uh, basically, if you see the ecosystems, uh, we can consider into four categories. The basic one is the provisioning ecosystem service. Now, what happens there is we get food, we get water, we get fiber, we get biochemicals, and also the genetic resources. This form the provisional ecosystems services from any ecosystem. Now, regulatory. What is regulatory? The water purification, water regulation, pollination, climatic impacts, disease, erosion prevention, carbon sequestration. So these things will regulate what happens in the ecosystem. All these uh, regulatory um, processes must go on in any ecosystem to keep it healthy and resilient. And what are the other things? The supporting uh, ecosystem services means it comes the primary production, the nutrient cycling, the soil formation, the life cycle maintenance, and element recycling. This again supports the uh, uh, the functioning of the food web or food cycle in the any ecosystem. Now, coming to the cultural value, this we cannot really say that it is a direct value, but this is also very important in maintaining in the evaluation of what services or how much economic value a ecosystem provides. That is the recreation facilities, the tourism potential, the spiritual value the aesthetic value, the inspirational value, and the educational value. So when we are taking a whole ecosystem, for example, if we take coral reef, what are the major provisioning services they give? What are the regulatory activities happening? What are the supporting services? And what are the cultural? All this can be taken and given a monetary value, and this process is known as ecosystem service valuation. This is now being done in many countries to assess the value of the ecosystem. Now, in this ecosystem, I will also highlight a few of the endangered marine species. I'm only listing a few here, but as per the IUCN red list, there are several thousands of endangered lists. This I have listed only, which we have, uh, which in the Indian context we have, I mean, highlighted as endangered. Now, it can vary from region to region, but as per the Indian conditions, we have at least these few species which are in the endangered list and the vulnerable list, and they need to be conserved. Why these need to be conserved? Because the ecosystem also needs to be conserved. Now, what are the threats that these marine species face? One is the accidental capture and entanglement in fishing nets. Other one is commercial overfishing. Now, if you know the sardinella is being overfished, then habitat destruction, mangroves are being destroyed, estuaries are being polluted, the, uh, the uh, sea, the coastal waters are being degraded, the habit is being changed, then you have pollution, and above all this, we also have many climatic factors. Nowadays, we are having too many floods, too many, what is it? earthquakes and so many other things which are all happening due to climate change. So what are the measures that we need to take to address these kind of threats? First is the man assist in the management of marine and coastal ecosystems of the region on a sustainable basis, particularly through sustainable practices. Now, how can we do that? We have to mobilize the political will and action of governments and other partners for the conservation, sustainable use of coral reefs and associated ecosystems such as mangroves and seagrass beds. We need to effectively communicate the value and importance of coral reefs, mangroves and seagrass beds, including their ecosystem services, the threats to their sustainability and the actions needed to protect them. We need to promote the ecosystem management approach and the principles and values of good governance for the conservation and management of marine ecosystems in the region. So what are the basic approaches? Now, uh, conservation of these ecosystems, there are many, many, many methods. There are many approaches. But in the recent times, as per the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, the most, most uh, what is it, advocated approach for management of ecosystems 
is what is known as the ecosystem approach to management, otherwise known as EAM or EBM. Now, what is ecosystem which deals with the functioning of the ecosystem and management in a holistic perspective? The overall objective of this approach is to sustain healthy marine ecosystems. Now, for example, in fisheries, we are trying to uh, conserve or protect certain species only. But that is not the correct approach. We need to protect the environment as a whole. That is the holistic approach. So, ecosystem health refers to a balanced, integrated, adaptive community of organisms having a species composition, diversity, and functional organization that has evolved naturally. And what is ecological integrity, maintenance of the ecosystem structure, that means biodiversity and function, which means ecosystem processes such as production, energy flow, and nutrient recycling. Now, all this can be done. How? It depends upon the data availability. It depends upon the spatial coverage of the whole region. It relevance to ecosystem service goals are some of the indicators which are taken into consideration for adopting the suitable approach in ecosystem approach to management. There's also the other approach, which is known as the precautionary approach in management, which lead to decisions based on best available allow stakeholders to buy into the management system, promote the capacity of the system to have memory, to learn, and to build on experience. So uh, the fisheries management tools, they focus on certain things. That is the stakeholder analysis, rapid rural appraisal, conflict management, marine protected areas, Fisheries is part of integrated coastal or river basin management. The process of problem analysis and planning of activities aim to address problems. And they also know what is known as the rapid rural appraisal to get a data for such a management. Now, I will speak a little about uh, stakeholder analysis. Actually, going back to our uh, initial target, that is the biodiversity targets as given by the IG uh, meet or the CBD, you know, now the most uh, appropriate approach is the uh, ecosystem based approachment. And in this, a very, very important criteria is the stakeholder consultation. Now, stakeholder consultation can be done only if you also do a stakeholder analysis. Now, what is stakeholder? What are, who is a stakeholder? For example, if you take uh, fishermen, the fishers are the primary stakeholders. Then you have, you have the government. Then you have NGOs interacting with them. You have the private sector. How private sector? You have the commercial uh, fish processing houses or exporting groups. Then you have research organizations, then you have donors who are willing to support certain projects like that. The stakeholder can be numerous. There can be primary, secondary, tertiary, and so on. Several stakeholders can be there for any management activity for a particular ecosystem. So all these people need to be consulted. They should be informed. They should be given the basic information on the uh, data that is available and what is the issue that has to be addressed. Now, if you uh, the stakeholder analysis, if you define, it is an approach for understanding a system by identifying the key actors or stakeholders in the system and assessing their respective interest in that system. So this is very vital because now you go and make some uh, management uh, decision. The state fisheries department will take some decision and then we go tell the fishermen, you please do this. No, that is not the right approach. We have to consult the stakeholder also because they have a stake in the environment. They have a stake in the ecosystem. They are the primary producers. They are the primary stakeholders. Their livelihood depends on that. So first thing will be the stakeholder consultation and find out who are the primary stakeholders who need to be identified and consulted. So it refers to a range of tools and <coughs> based on the attributes, 
inter relationships interest and uh, in a given initiative or resource often they are also part of the situation analysis so why should we do that because you we need to understand the existing pattern of interactions we need to mobilize key stakeholders and to build up a common awareness this is one important criteria in capacity building we have to target interventions and approaches based on this awareness that we have to create in stakeholders so it's a vital management tool also in policy making and it is also a tool to predict and manage conflicts now if you, you know you may be aware that any group you try to manage there will be difference of opinion there will be conflicts so how to manage these conflicts for example i'm sure you may be aware if you go to any coastal area there will be two groups of fishermen so there will be some conflict there will be some simple reason simple uh, cause but we need to identify that and this conflict management can be done only if we understand their requirements and create a common awareness so how to understand stakeholders we need to understand their views we need to understand their values we need to understand their ideals we also need to understand their cultural context we need to understand their interests and the power in what lab in the state multi stakeholder system we need to understand what is their contribution and at what level they have power and also what are the conflicts that are likely to come up now i'm almost coming to the end of my thing here i just like to highlight one thing is this is a marine protected area now if you see here there are several stakeholders is not there will be people who are in the in interested in fishing there are people who are living there there are people who have recreational thing they take uh, tourists for uh, what say boat rides and showing them the whole marine protected area so many activities are involved now when such a marine protected area is there who decides what is to be done since this is a marine protected area in the philippines you know philippines is small small islands and they have several such areas which needs to be protected so these are boats which are used for recreational fishing or purpose only for diving so the other people who do fishing for a livelihood there are several people involved in this now you need to consult each of these stakeholders how it is done you have to form a group you have to identify all the stakeholders you have to discuss with them get their consent and get get them involved in the management process so here i have seen the concerned people living in the in and around the marine protected area were given the task of managing their own resource that is they will decide who will do the fishing at what time how much fish they will extract how they will protect the endangered species and who will be responsible to uh, what is say if there is a violation of the rules who will take charge of that and who will take the penalty for that all these things are discussed and formed by the group so it is what we need to think about is the local managing group is very important in the management of such marine ecosystems which are very sensitive and very pristine so i think uh, i hope i've been able to convey some as idea on the uh, diverse importance of marine biodiversity and the need for conservation and the methods that are utilized to counter to conserve the ecosystem resources through ecosystem approach and also conserve the and uh, protect the endangered species so this was during my trip to philippines i had a chance to meet all these this kind of groups who are themselves managing the marine protected areas so thank you this lady is uh, uh, catching an octopus from the lakshadweep islands you see how very efficiently she has harpooned and caught an octopus so that is uh, what we must protect the coral reef ecosystem is theirs not ours so it is their island we need to protect their livelihood and the environment thank you thank you all thank you ma'am for a comprehensive presentation
it's time for queries from participants. You can put your queries in the chat box. Ma'am? Yeah. Um, one of the queries that what yeah. a common man can do to conserve the marine biodiversity. Definitely. Common man, see, the, my last point was entirely that the common man is dependent on a particular ecosystem, you understand. So, what is his what is he doing? What is his role in the ecosystem? For example, I will take the example of a fisherman. So he is going for fishing, he is catching some fish, but he also knows that he must not catch the young fish, right? The juveniles. He should not catch that because he should allow the juveniles to grow to a particular level and breed at least once in a lifetime. So that awareness, that knowledge he already has. So what should be his role? His role should be he should avoid catching the juveniles. So he can very well put back the juveniles that he has caught. If they are still alive, he can definitely put it back into the system. The other thing is, the, they are all aware that large animals like the turtles or the dewbongs are all protected ones. They, even, we, even we don't have to create awareness. They themselves, they know it. So what is their role? They must also participate in the protection of these endangered forms. The other thing is that they, they often they risk their lives during the, uh, what do you say, for example, during the monsoon or during the uh, tsunami time, even if there is morning, many fishermen have ventured. Now, this is very, very, you know, they, they know that nature has a way. Nature has a way of, uh, what is it, taking care of the natural resources. So during this time, it is also un an understood that these people should be away from the ecosystem and allow nature to do its role in the recovery of the nature. So uh, this is a basic thing. Common man, in many ways, he has a role to play he, wherever he is, whether it's the fisheries or on the island, the terrestrial habitat or whichever it is. So they sh each person should realize the planet is for all. So the, the important thing is we should uh, live and let live. That means not only we should use the environmental benefits for our this thing, but also think of the next, uh, at least next three generations. Because the way it is just going now, you see, for example, plastic. How we just created a havoc in our environments. You know, if you go into the beach, you will get tons and tons of water bottles. So these are, this is at the individual level, it can be done. So my request at the individual level is first we need to self discipline ourselves and stop damaging the polluting the environment because everything is ultimately going to the sea everything goes to the sea so this is uh, i think i hope i answered the question yeah okay hey, ma'am and that query is what we can do to develop ecological ego on lemon ecological ego Ego. Yes. I think uh, maybe ec ecological responsibility. Like uh, yeah, yes. it's a social response, like social responsibility. It is ecological responsibility. Yes, that again answers my same question. Each individual is responsible for protecting the planet. Wherever it is, his local community, you see, if you don't, if you stop polluting the local environment, that means you are contributing. If you stop contributing, you're damaging your local environment, you're contributing. We see, for example, you're living in a, a small colony or somewhere where there is a canal running. If you go and put all your junk in the canal, what will happen? The canal will get blocked, is it not? So in this year, it has happened. This year, many drainages were blocked with fully plastics. So where is your social responsibility? Don't you have the responsibility to take these plastics and put it in the particular uh, bin where the corporation or some other body will collect it and go rather than dump it, dumping it in the public place or in the canals or in the drainage systems. So that is social responsibility. I'm sure now most of us, we are separating plastic waste and other waste, domestic waste and things like that. This awareness has come a little too late. I think we should have done all this a little earlier. Now, plastic has taught us a lesson. Now, I think this COVID pandemic also has taught us many, many lessons. But I am a little skeptical whether people will still learn. 
i think the next point the next major hazard we are going to face is we will find mass all over the place it will all be going to the sea is it not all the mass that we are wearing will not destroy it properly it will all go to the ocean just like plastic i am sure it will all go so this is where our social responsibility is our ecological responsibility that we must not pollute our environment we must take care of our environment and to the extent possible let us make our our local environment green more green then plant at least put up 10 trees the saplings and allow them to become trees so this is our local contribution individual contribution to our local environment this will help the planet in the long way okay ma'am uh and the uh, query is how far the education system from the school level encourage yeah. the protection of marine environment yeah actually uh, i'm happy you have asked this question because i to i think about 5 6 years ago this kind of awareness was not being created in the school level but now i'm sure it is happening now schools are also a little bit uh, proactive and as research institutions we are also trying to do our job we are conducting open house sessions and other things and inviting school students and college students and telling them this is what is happening to our environment our planet save our planet or this is from our side we can do similarly i find that many schools are now having very serious uh, approach towards uh, the environment uh, uh, protection measures so they are really creating awareness camps and they are uh, having uh, what to say green days and uh, green workshops and things like that in many cities i mean in fact uh, visima farai also has participated in such things so they are trying to see that the children are caught young they are made aware young so that they will be fully disciplined to carry this forward it's not the duty of the elders alone so if you can catch the youngsters at a very early age and i'm sure there is a lot of awareness now now children are more aware of what it means to make the planet more green what it means to protect our ocean they are aware but i think a little more work has to be done definitely it has started it has started but we need to do it more on a more intense level thank you ma'am i think the queries are over okay uh, so now i welcome mrs hira ks the webinar series coordinator and assistant professor of this college to deliver the vote of thanks a warm good afternoon to one and all respected principal honorable resource person of the day esteemed participants dear colleagues and my dear students we have now come to the close of a very fruitful session on marine diversity and its conservation led by dr p lakshmi lada principal scientist and head mfd cmfri kochi it is my privilege being conferred the duty to propose the vote of thanks for all those who have worked towards making the event a grand success at the onset i take this opportunity to place on record my gratitude on behalf of our institution to hmdp sabha our management which has been the backbone for providing us with this platform to actualize today's webinar as part of our teacher empowerment webinar series and even like this cannot happen overnight it requires planning and a birds eye view for details i extend my sincere thanks to our beloved principal dr asha os who has provided the needed support and guidance to make this webinar a success The day's highlight has been our eminent resource person, Dr. P. Lakshmi Lata. An in-depth study and deliverance was evident from today's webinar, which was thickly packed with de a detailed description on the biodiversity and its conservation. She has underlined the importance of protecting mangroves, which acts as strong protectors to prevent soil erosion. Detailed analysis of the major threats. of marine biodiversity and the need to preserve sea resources like deep sea corals and related species all have helped us to realize the importance and work towards preserving the marine species 
for the betterment of a society. On behalf of SNM Training College, I extend my heartfelt thanks to you, ma'am, for providing a deep insight into the session. Thank you. Special thanks to the coordinator of this webinar, Dr. Sunidhi A.S., for choosing a very relevant topic in today's scenario and for choosing the right person to lead the webinar on marine biodiversity and its conservation. The success of any program is its participants. I am indebted to all the esteemed participants who have made their presence felt through their participation throughout. I'm thankful to all my colleagues, teaching and non-teaching staff of SNM family who have worked together to make this day a fruitful one. Last but not the least, I extend my heartfelt thanks to all our students who have been part and parcel of this webinar. Thanks to all once again. And with these words, I conclude. Thank you all. We are at the end of today's program. I request all of you to rise for the national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jaya hai Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Utkala Vanga Vindya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Utchala Jaladhi Taranga तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे the webinar session is over. Once again, I thank you all who participated in this program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suniti. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Now you can leave the meeting. All the participants can leave the meeting.